Um, well, it's good to be here. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and open up to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It'll take us a while to get here. Um, 2020 has been absolutely crazy, uh, and it's sort of summarized when we are here at Wake Up Today. It's sunny in Salem, Oregon, and it's pouring rain in San Diego. So I don't know if I brought the sunshine with me. I am leaving tonight, and so I see the rain's kicking back up tomorrow and the next day. And so, uh, but but really the wildness of of this year, there's been so many different sort of give and takes, and and we're going to talk about some of the uncertainty that's kind of gone along with that. Um, As Pastor Pierre mentioned, we we go back to, to seminary, Bible college seminary. I'm not exactly sure. I did Bible college and seminary sort of back to back. And we overlapped during that window, and then uh, we, we, you know, our lives continued to, to intersect with one another. And so, like I said, I agree with him on just about everything except for his football allegiance. He likes Brazil. Obviously, he's Brazilian. Uh, my wife grew up in Spain, and so my family, we, we have an allegiance to Spain. Brazil's kind of like the Goliath of the football world. And so I'd like to recruit you guys over to the good guys of Spain. I know I'm a Navy SEAL, but it's like I'm so glad I married into a culture where they actually have a winning sports team. San Diego doesn't have any of that. We don't have anything. Any, well, we have baseball. We did pretty good this year, but our family is mostly in soccer and hockey. Um, my brother-in-law asked me to send a message, uh, and I saw it was in the announcements. And, and uh, my brother-in-law, who is a professor over at, in Pittsburgh, He wanted me to make an announcement to let you all know uh, that this is indeed Beaver Nation. And so I got two hands in this this one. I see the big civil wars coming up in a few weeks. My brother-in-law graduated from OSU, and that's uh, so so it's... uh, you know, so I, you know, to create some division, if we don't have enough of that already, we can do that with another type of football. Um, I was supposed to come back in May for, for Memorial Day. Uh, Pierre said that it would be great for me to, to come and, and to share, just to, to meet the, the body of believers here, uh, to talk to those who are going on the Israel trip, and, and just, just to teach. And so he said it would be great if you could share some Navy SEAL stories. And so he said, well, that will be great. Memorial Day makes a lot of sense to, to do that, and I can come and share. And how this year has unfolded, uh, it sounds like you guys are about, you, we use different verbiage from state to state, uh, but it sounds like you guys are, there's, a, there's a, a worse tier being threatened to you guys. And for us, that, that happened back in, in May. Uh, the, the week before I was supposed to come, our governor uh, basically shut down all the churches from being inside, and so we were forced outside. Uh, th- this is a little bit of a downgrade from the last service in the main sanctuary, but this is all an upgrade for me because we've been outside for the last six months or so. I've been standing on a little uh, a kid's table like for, for kindergartners, and, and so wobbly out on the patio. Thankfully, we have the weather for it. Um, but that week, I, I called him and I said, Pierre, like our governor just shut us down and I, I can't leave the church this week when we're trying to figure out. And so then we said, well, Veterans Day is kind of like Memorial Day. There's distinctions, but it's a, a, a military sort of message would fit. And so I scheduled the trip for this Sunday. And it was about a month ago, my wife pointed out to me Gunnar, do you realize that you scheduled a trip to Portland the Sunday after the election? I don't know if you guys have been following the news, but there's been stuff going on in Portland. Like even we in San Diego are aware of what's going on. And so my wife was a little uneasy about it. There's some people from my church that are just like, Gunnar, you're just trying to get back in the action, aren't you? You want a little bit of excitement. So I can neither, you know, confirm nor deny that. Um... So normally I do teach just a book of the Bible. I normally get right, right into it. Uh, with what's been asked of me today, uh, I'm going to share some stories about my time in the, in the military, and then I'm going to go to the passage. So I'm going to take way more time than I would normally do sort of telling stories. When I asked Pierre what my time limit was, he said the second service, there's a lot of flexibility. So if I go long, blame him. And... 
and I'll, I'll you know, try to stick to, this, to, to the script of how much time I have allotted. Um, but I, I'm, I need to share the stories in order to share this passage uh, that God used in my life to bring me great comfort. Um, it was through this passage that God r- really, I think, got a hold of, of my life, not in the sense of salvation, but in the sense of transitioning sort of um, from the military into the ministry and, and really understanding sort of the, 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 the so what of life. Um, we each are gonna die one day and we're gonna give an account to God. And, and that's really the so what of our lives. And, and so everything that we do leading to that moment matters. And this passage, it, there's, there's great comfort, there's great exhortation for us to really live our lives in a way that's uh, meaningful and faith, faithful to, to Christ and what he's called each of us to. And so with that, let's pray, and we'll get into kind of our passage today in a few minutes. Father, we do thank you and praise you for this day. I, I thank you, Lord, for this, uh, this time th- that we have to gather. Lord, here in 2020, when there has been uh, just a lot of challenges for churches across the nation and, and truly around the world about uh, gathering and how do we gather? How do we do it safely? How uh, are we uh, being challenged in a way of affliction and knowing how to meet and, and do we meet? And, and Lord, there's just so much tension and anxiety in our world and our nation today. And so, Father, in the midst of all of the noise, I ask that you would lead us by your spirit today. I pray, Father, that you would uh, use a little bit of my story to, uh, to encourage people here. I pray, Father, that you would, you would ultimately speak to us through your word. May your spirit illuminate its meaning and help us to understand uh, the text that's before us in a meaningful and relevant way. I pray that we would leave this place uh, grow closer to you and more like you and just more encouraged Uh, about this life that you've given us. It's no accident that we find ourselves in this place in history. Uh, In the midst of the coronavirus, you have appointed each one of us a certain amount of time in a certain geographical region uh, for your purposes. And so we ask that you would help us uh, to be obedient to you in all things. And it's in Christ's good name I pray. Amen. All right, well, I know I only have so much room for the camera. I like to move around, and the first thing that I have here is SEAL training is arguably the most uh, difficult military training worldwide. I graduated military training April 25th of 1995. I was in BUDS class 198, and we started with approximately 180 guys. It might have been like 186. It was somewhere in the 180s. We graduated 12 students, so out of the 180, 12 of us made it straight through the program. We added some add-ons, like guys that got hurt along the way that joined our class later on. Um, Inevitably, what people like to hear about with my SEAL background is the antics and trouble and things that I got into, which Gunner got into a lot of trouble growing up. I was not a believer going into the military. I was not raised in the church. Uh, I I didn't know much about Christianity. Uh, I was in a Roman Catholic home, but it wasn't really much of a a, a religious sort of experience. I had to do my hour on Sunday because God gave me seven days. The least I could do was give him an hour, and if I sat still through church, I would get a donut afterwards. And so... For my experience of church growing up, it was boring. I was bored to death, and I just needed to sit still long enough so that I could get a donut. And so that was my worldview, basically, is that church was meaningless. I'm trying to, that was a tangent, and I'm going, okay, how do I tie that back in here? This is like the dance. I have more time, so I'm trying to use it up. Um, so inevitably, I got in a lot of trouble. I wasn't a Christian. That's, that's how I tie it back in. And at my senior year of high school, I turned 18 in September of my, of my senior year in high school, 
I knew that my dad was not going to fund me going to college, even junior college, to go party it up. And so I thought I was going to go do something where nobody could tell me what to do. And so I joined the U.S. Navy to go to the SEAL teams. <laughs> I'd seen the movies. I'd read, uh, I'd read maybe a little couple books. And so I was inspired to go take on the world and wreak havoc in people's lives. And, and, and quite frankly, the people who do make it into special forces, they do well in very dangerous, uh, high-threat uh, calculated sort of risks, and, and often in sort of a society, we find ourselves getting in more trouble, m mainly because we're wired in a certain way to go take on the world. And so I got into a lot of trouble. I almost got kicked out of training multiple times. I was on that fine line, but clearly the instructor saw something in me that, that, that they allowed me to continue. One of the questions that I'm often asked is, did you ever want to quit? And the answer to that is simply yes. There's a whole bunch of times. Uh, there were two times in particular when I came very, very close to ringing out, which you ring a bell three times, and that means that you're done with training. Uh, the first time came in November of 1994. It was the, I think it was the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, and it was the Wednesday before Sunday in which we started Hell Week. And so it was very cold in San Diego when you're around this many guys in this sort of environment. You're constantly uh, getting bugs and colds and flus. And I had a horrible flu. I, I was running a fever. I was just miserable. And we were about to finish the day. I was about to get through it. And the instructors threw a curveball to us. They said, you guys, go get in your swim gear. You have a three and a half mile time swim. Those are, those are nautical miles, not statute miles, so it's a little bit further. We'd only done two mile time swims up to that point, but so they wanted us to swim a little bit longer that day. And so we went and traded out, and I got in the water with my swim buddy, Tom Retzer, who we went all the way through training together. And uh, Tommy and I, we were like twi twiddle D and Tweedledum. I don't know if that's the same, but we... Uh, we were paired together, you know, super uh, best friends from the beginning. If one of us wasn't getting in trouble, the other one was, and, and it was always flipping back and forth. He was my swim buddy. And so I started to swim with this flu, and you, you go out in the ocean, you swim the, the beach, you go down to a boat, and you turn around. And I was so miserable on this swim. I'm having this conversation with myself I don't think doctors recommend when you have the flu going for a three-mile ocean swim during the wintertime. And so I was, I was making all of the excuses in my mind of, you know, that my friends would still respect me, mom and dad would still love me, and, all, you know, all of these stories that made it okay for me to quit. And I was convinced that what I was going to do is I was going to quit at the turnaround point. I didn't want to quit in the midst of the swim going down there because I didn't want to hurt my, my very dear friend Tom. And so we got to the turnaround bo boat. At that point, if I quit, they would have just thrown him with another pair of swimmers that were at our speed, and then he would have continued on. I would have been thrown in the boat, and then I would have began processing out of buds. And so what happened when we got to the boat? There were no other swimmers around. We were all alone. And so I said to myself, oh, I'll just quit at the finish line. And so we turn around, we, we finish, and at the end of that, it was the end of the day. So I'm like, why in the world would I quit now? And so then, then the moment passed. I went into Thanksgiving weekend and ultimately made it through Hell Week. Our, our class reduced down. Uh, I, uh, Hell Week, are you allowed to talk about it? You're allowed to talk about hell at church. Yeah, this is, this is a good place to talk about it. And, uh, and so Hell Week is five days. It starts Sunday night and it goes to, to Friday. And over the course of the week, you get a cumulative of three hours total sleep. It's miserable. It, it's, hell, I think, would be a great place to vacation uh, that's tongue in cheek. I can't. That I don't think is true. Um, but we made it through, and then ultimately, after you get through Hell Week, you begin to to learn what it's like to be a SEAL. You start doing more things. So you move from first phase, and then you get your brown T-shirt, uh, which means that you made it through Hell Week. And then you go into second phase, which is dive phase, and you learn how to scuba dive. You spend the first few weeks, learn how to open circuit dive, which is simply when you inhale uh, and then you exhale, the bubbles come out to the surface. That's open circuit diving. Uh, then when you pass a rigorous test of pool comp where they, uh, they essentially drown you underwater 
and you have to do everything right as they're drowning you underwater. You, gr you graduate to the next level and you get to learn how to dive a closed circuit. Now closed circuit, if open circuit means the bubbles go up, the closed circuit means that when you, you inhale, you exhale, it stays uh, contained within the rib, rig and there's no bubbles. This is like super high speed. Uh, this is like real frogman stuff. It's a big deal. And so Tom and I made it through pool comp. And we're on the, the rebreathers for the first time going on this open water dive. It was huge. And they briefed us before the dive, uh, all the things that you need to do. And if you hear concussion grenades, that you're supposed to come to the surface because that means that somebody's been hurt or there's something. They need to recall you from underwater, so you need to come up. And so when you're going through training, you're terrified that every little thing you do is going to be a screw-up because you could do everything right, and they're still going to hammer you. So you're extremely jumpy about things. And so we start this dive. I was the driver, which, which meant that I had the attack board. It's this little black thing, and then there's a compass on here that tells you where to go. There's a depth gauge and a stopwatch. It's your mission to, to steer your team. You have everything memorized. I have to go 15 minutes out this direction, change my bearing, and come back. The other guy who's tied to you, which was Tom, his job was to make sure we didn't run into anything, and he's kind of looking around, and he's carrying a buoy. There's a line that goes up to the surface so the instructors can kind of grade where you're going. Without the buoy, there's no bubbles. They can't find you. They don't know where you are. It becomes very dangerous from an instructor perspective, which I also was. And so we get about halfway out. We start hearing some, like, noises. But there's a lot of noises in San Diego Bay. I mean, there's banging from the Navy ships. There's boats. There's just noises. And we hadn't actually ever been underwater when something exploded. So when they said that there'd be explosions, we're not quite sure what, like, what does that sound like? And so we heard an explosion, and we stopped and looked at each other. Mm -hmm. like it was like, you know, we're talking to you. You can hear, but you can't hear because you have a thing in your mouth. We're like, was that an explosion? We're like, let's go up. We go up. We look around. I saw an instructor. I wasn't sure that the instructor saw me, but that was okay. And I'm like, well, the world seems to be at, at, as it's supposed to be. Let's just go back down and we'll finish our dive. We're getting towards the end of the dive. I'm on the attack board. Out of the corner of my eye, I can see the instructor boat pulling up. And I'm like, that's not good. I can see like three instructors. We're getting like where we can stand up, but we, we're still trying to hide from them. And then I can see the instructor with the paddle, and he just slams the paddle down right in the back of Tom's head. I'm like, Ooh, that looked like it hurt. So we stand up, and there's like, all I know is there's this barrage of yelling. And I'm trying to figure out what's going on. And the one thing I get is like, where's your buoy? And I got my attack board. I look at Tom. I'm like, where's, where's the buoy? He's like, that's a good question. Where's our buoy? Well, that was a very big deal. They had been trying to recall everybody because they were looking for us. And so... Tom almost got a stone out of training. Somehow, some way, the instructors had grace on us, and they said, okay, these are good students. They screwed up. We're going to let them go on, but we're going to just kind of keep our eyes on them. We eventually made it through second phase. Oh, we're so thankful. Then we go on to being like real Navy SEALs because we're issued camis, and we start getting guns, and we start blowing up stuff, and we're like learning how to land navigate. It was just wonderful, like awesome. Blowing up stuff is great, guy. Like it's a lot of fun. Like, like this was every little boy's dream. I can see one guy nodding. He must have blown up some stuff. So it's like, you know, tell some stories afterwards. And then, and uh, okay, where are we at? So I have a little get lost in my stories. And he said, I'm good on time. So I'm just going to rock and roll with this. And so we're, 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 we're going through training and, and we're flying kind of back and forth to different places. And in the midst of this, in the barracks where we're at, the, the rooms are, there's like one room where two guys stay, there's a, a shared bathroom, and then there's another room. And somewhere along the line, as students have sort of gone away, they moved us from the one room to the adjoining room, and then nobody moved into our old room. Now, all of the doors, it was like a, a keypad that you just kind of plugged in the code, and you could have access to the room. Those didn't change. 
And so when they moved us into our new room, we had the wonderful idea that we don't have to live in the new room. We just have it always ready for, sh- for inspections. <laughs> we'll live in the old room and trash it. It was genius, or so we thought. As an instructor, it was the most foolish thing that any, it was like we were set up by them. As an instructor, I know that was the case. And so we're, we have our immaculate room. They could have a surprise inspection anytime. You could eat off our floors. It was like a mirror. Now the other room, it was a different story. And they sent us out to training out at Mount Laguna. It's like a, uh, an hour drive from San Diego. It's up in the mountains. It rained on us. It was cold and miserable. We're, we're like muddy. And I was lazy. Well, I, I am lazy. Like I've had to work, uh, compensate for my laziness. But I, my nature is to be a total slob. And so we have the inspection room. We get back. I'm like, I'm just going to throw my muddy stuff in my locker. There's nothing to worry about. We got, we're like the high life. And... And I'm like, I'll deal with this stuff later. Well, we were doing some evolution, and Tom had to go to the dentist or medical or something, so we're all alone. And and we get word that there was going to be a room inspection. No problem. (laughs) Surprise room inspection. Tom's gone. Normally I'd be worried because he was a little bit more senior than me, so normally he'd be the one manning the interaction with the instructors. And so I'm, I'm standing at my door, just waiting for the instructors to come. I had all the stuff that I needed to sound out to them with. And while I'm kind of going, just like, I had like a little smirk on my face, like I beat them, no big deal. I can hear screaming from the bathroom. And I'm kind of going, well, that sounds really close. And then I'm just trying to act like, oh, my mind's playing games on me. Then I hear stuff like thrash, like, like things are being knocked over. And... And I'm like, this is exactly what I think it is. Our, like, this isn't good. And, and so they come and scream at me. They're like, get over here, Hanson. And I go in there, and I'm trying to assess the situation. I noticed that Tom was smart enough to buy a lock for his locker, and I wasn't. And so I'm like, oh, Houston, we got a problem. And so the first reaction is just lie about it. So I'm like, so I have no idea what this is. And it starts like, you're telling me you don't have any idea what it is? And at this point, I think post-traumatic stress takes over. And I have this image of my pants that were in the locker that were all muddy flying through the air. And there were sunflower seeds like all in the room. So I must have had a pack of sunflower seeds in my pocket. And they're like, how do these pants say Hanson? And you say it's not yours. And now I was, I'm not going to change up on the lie. I was going to stick to it. I said, I, this is just a random coincidence. And then my next plan is like, well, Tom wasn't there to defend himself, so I'm going to sell out Tom. And so I say, this must be Retzer's problem. I don't, I don't know anything about this. And so uh, the next few moments are a blur. Later in the day, I think the instructors were convening whether we were going to get kicked out of training we were supposed to fly to San Clemente Island in like three days, which is our last little bit of training right before graduation. And I think, oh man, we're going to get kicked out. And this was, this was bad. Like they, they were done playing nice guy with us. And then Jake, one of my, my leader of the class, I have to be careful not to use uh, acronyms with people. And uh, so Jake comes in with the head officer of our, that was their students. And, they, and he's like this big biker dude, and he was like a lot older than me. Like he was a super old man, so he's probably like 22. <laughs> like I was 18, and so he, he was like this super old crusty guy at 22. And, and he's all bowed up like he's going to beat us up. So gunners always relied on comedy to get themselves out of trouble. And so I look at him. I notice at our bedroom window, the shades were pulled open. I said, Jake, I don't know what you're about to do to us but you need to close the curtains before you do whatever because I don't want you getting in trouble for what we did. <laughs> you know, trying to be real stoic here. And uh, so then they started laughing like, okay, you guys, you're not getting kicked out of training. We stood up for you, but you guys have to get a little divorce. You're no longer somebody's. You got to be put with somebody else. And so they separated us from training. And so we went, we, we were, so I lost my best friend, and it was terrible. I got paired with some guy from Philadelphia who I'm still friends with, and just wasn't the same. 
Then we graduated, we both go to SEAL Team 3. Now SEAL Team 3 did not know about the divorce. And so we find ourselves in the same platoon. We whittled our way into the same platoon again. And a platoon in the SEAL teams is only like 14 guys. And so we found ourselves in the same platoon, getting in the same amount of trouble, but it was worse now. Uh, I'm sure the military doesn't do this anymore, you know, Paul, but hazing was a thing back then. And we were always getting hazed. We were always getting beat up. They were giving us happy hats left and right. Now, just to clear, like a happy, there's nothing happy about a happy hat. A, a happy hat is when they take duct tape, but it's rigorous tape, so it's like high speed duct tape in the military. And they tape your head all up, they tape your whole body up, and then they drag you around and beat you up. And one day we found ourselves at the range shooting. At the end of the day, I, I look over at Tom and his hair is all greasy. I'm like, Tom, what, what's in your hair? He's like, it's gun oil, dude. And I'm like, why, why are you so proud to have a gun oil in your hair? Like, what, what, what happened? He's like, they're not going to be able to give me a happy hat. And I'm like, you're going to get us killed, man. And there's a lot of antics. Like, I can't, I, like, I, I mean, fear gave me a lot of time. I'm probably, I don't, I'm probably, like, worn out my welcome. But I, we got in a lot of trouble. I, I ultimately got in real trouble, and I, I had had a resisting evading arrest. Uh, I was drinking and driving. I didn't get charged with that at 20 years old. And I ultimately lost my security clearance. And it was during that window uh, when I became a Christian. But Tom and I got separated again. And so I, I, had to, I got pulled out of that platoon. And, and so I had to deal with my trouble. Tom went on in the platoon that we were in. I finally got out of trouble. Everything was resolved. And, and uh, I was thrown into another platoon. And so Tom and I were still at, at SEAL Team 3. But we were sort of in different cycles. And so we didn't see each other a lot. We had uh, one moment, it was in 2000, when we bumped into each other again at SEAL Team 3. So I was at SEAL Team 3 for like six years. Tom was there for six years, but we didn't see each other a lot because of the opposite schedules. And so we were at the SEAL Team 3 weight room and just really excited to see each other. I told him I was about ready to go to first phase as an instructor. He was on his way to to SEAL Team 6 or Naval Special Warfare Development Group uh, where he would serve. Uh, At that point, I had become a Christian and... We fast forward like six years. I had been a Christian now for six years. I think it was 1996 when I became a Christian. Uh, My story is much like I became a Christian somewhere in there. I don't exactly know where. Uh, My wife, by her litmus test, she's like, well, I can tell that you were a Christian, like that you're actually living as a Christian by 1996. And so in the weight room, I remember kind of like really feeling like God was telling me to share with Tom about my Christianity and this newfound religion that I'd come into and how my life had really changed and how I wasn't drinking anymore. And, and, and I really just resisted God's leading. I was, I'm like, I'm not going to do that. So six years later, on June 26, 2003, I was a first phase instructor working at Hell Week. And I'd been working the gra- graveyard shift, and I came home and went to bed, and the phone rang, and my wife answered the phone, and it was Jake Taylor, the guy that, you know, the big guy that was going to rough me up. And Jake says to Anna, I need to talk to Gunner. And she's like, Jake, he's been working Hell Week. He's, I, I have very strict orders not to wake him up. And he, and he said, no, Anna, you got to go wake him up. And so when I got the phone, my whole world was rocked. Uh, Jake broke the news to me that my best friend in the whole wide world was uh, killed in an ambush the night before in Afghanistan with SEAL Team 6. Um, And my whole world imploded. Like, I was a a Christian at this point. I had an, I I was actually even in Bible college, not for so much the ministry, but I wanted to take in the Bible because I was so ignorant of, like, Christianity that I just wanted to take more of it into me. And so I knew kind of the Christian, the Christianese sort of answers about how does life and death and all of this work out, but the reality of it being in my soul, that's a very different story. And so this phone call sent me into an emotional tailspin 
Uh, my wife and I, we lost our first child at this, during this window. Um, Tom was the first of, of, of many seals that were killed over the last 20 years. Uh, it sounds silly, but up to that point, I knew that we were a war-fighting organization, but we truly thought we were invincible, and we had been because Vietnam was the last time we suffered any major casualties. And in addition to my dealing with death, I had this, like, true remorse and guilt knowing that I had pushed back against God in the weight room of sharing my faith with Tom. And that was the last time that I ever saw Tom. And I don't know if you've ever experienced this sort of implosion in your life where your whole world is rocked. Certainly there's been plenty of opportunities in 2020 for that with the coronavirus, with job losses or threats of losing your job. Certainly there are people who are are legitimately afraid of getting the coronavirus. Um, In addition to the coronavirus, in addition to the elections, in addition to like everything that's going on, people die. People deal with cancer in my own life. We have a little girl at our church battling leukemia, My sister-in-law is battling lymphoma. And when we are faced with death, it's hard to grapple with this. And so there I was in 1996, and somebody had invited me like a month or two after Tom had died to go to this uh, men's Bible retreat up in Pine Valley. And during the... I don't remember anything about the actual retreat. I only went out there for the day. But they had sort of scheduled long blocks to do whatever you want to do. And I remember just taking my Bible and going out into the woods and just sort of, you know, playing Russian roulette with the Bible. You know, like, God, I need something. And my Bible fell open to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And as I went to that text and I started reading the verses that we're about to go through, it was like God was speaking to me from his word. Like, there, like I've read the Bible a lot, but there are moments when it's like God is just giving you a word from himself. And then God used this passage, I, I think really to propel me into the ministry. Uh, it was the, sec- the first scripture that I ever preached on in my life. And a scripture that God has used to keep me grounded. And I hope uh, this passage will encourage you today. Um, I know I'm probably short on time, but I'm going to go as as quick as I can through the passage. So in verse 16, if we, I know I said chapter 5, verse 1, but if we back up to chapter 4, verse 16, we start with a therefore we do not lose heart. When I read that that afternoon, I had lost heart. I'd lost all hope. Uh, I was discouraged. I, I, did, I just didn't know what God was doing. I don't know why I was so surprised. I was a Navy SEAL, for crying out loud. Like, I knew that we were in the business of death and war. But this one was personal, and it hurt really hard. And it says, therefore, we don't lose heart. And so when you see a therefore in the scripture, you have to ask, why is it therefore? Like, what's it therefore? What's the therefore, therefore? And so to answer this question, if we go back up to verse 14, we'll see that Paul had just written, he who raised the Lord Jesus will rise us. So he's speaking about after death that you'll be risen from the dead as the Lord Jesus was written. Therefore, we don't lose heart, but though our outer man is decaying, Yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. So he's saying our our outer man, that's your body, that's your flesh, the things that you see, your your flesh, your blood, your your life. This this part of us is, is following the second law of thermodynamics, moving from order to disorder, deteriorating. Your hair gets thin uh, or gone. Sorry, he mentioned he was getting cold out there. He's like, you still got hair. And I'm like, sorry, man. It's, but it's like we're, we're falling apart as we get older. 
And so there's this contrast through this section that we see between the now and the then. And so he says, the, don't lose heart. Our outer man is passing away and we are all de- deteriorating and we all are gonna die. But the inner man is being renewed day by day. I didn't understand this at the time, but I can tell you looking back 17 years from the death of Tom and experiencing a lot of death since then, I can see how God has used these difficult times in my own life to renew me and to refine me and to make him more like himself in my own life. He goes on to say in verse 17, for momentary light affliction is producing for us. Now I just wanna pause. We certainly are going through some afflictions. I don't know about organ per se, but I, I, I know that when, uh, when you look at the electoral college map, California, Oregon, Washington seem to be like-minded uh, in, a lot of, in a lot of ways. And for the church in California, I don't know that we can say persecution. We might be on the line. There's certainly some affliction. It sounds like your governor has given you guys a little bit more grace than we are getting. Uh, But in all that we've gone through, it's not the same as what Paul is describing. They were being executed for their profession of Christ. Their affliction was so much worse, and yet Paul describes it as light affliction, but he contrasts it with this eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. He says, but when we contrast what we're going through and we look to the future, there's just not even a comparison. Verse 18, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So the things that we see, the things that we sort of gauge life on and sort of measure how we're doing, a lot of it is what we can see and touch and feel. And Paul says all of this stuff is temporal. It's going away. It's it's not going to be here forever. The things that matter are the things that you can't see. Those are for eternity. Now to chapter one, verse chapter five, verse one. He says, For that if the earthly tent, which is our home, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens, for indeed this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked, for indeed while we are in this tent, we groan, being burdened because we do not want to be unclothed but clothed. Now there's a couple key words here. We see tent. Tent is your body, your physical body that you dwell in in this life. It's described as a tent. The other word that should jump out at you is this word groan. It happens twice. It says in this tent we groan. Sort of paints the picture like I described as you get older. It's funny, before when I was younger, I'd get hurt and it'd be like, what happened to you? It's like, man, I was jumping out of a plane and all the wind came up and I got thrashed, I hit side of a building or something, like some cool story connected to the scars. Today, it's like, ah, oh, man, my back hurts, what hurts? Or how'd you do it? I don't know, I was sleeping in my bed last night and something, I don't know. Like, your, our bodies are just falling apart. My wife was supposed to be on this trip. I think she's watching online. I have to be very careful navigating this next section. <laughs> Thankfully, due to COVID, uh, the airline was like, yeah, you can throw your daughter in her place. We're, we'll waive the fees. And so my daughter got the trip. And so we, we land in Portland last night. And it was, it was like three in the afternoon. And it was just very weird weather. Like there was like moisture coming out of the sky, which was very unique for us. But the sun was shining also. And there was like this rainbow, and then going down the road, it was like a Hallmark movie. Like the trees have different colors, and my daughter's in the back just going, this is so beautiful, so beautiful. And I'm thinking of the days when I used to go camping. So back in 2002, I got married. My wife grew up in Sevilla, Spain, a bustling city, city, concrete. She loves it. And we get married in 2002, or late in 2002, her family was gonna do a camping trip at Sequoia, and I say, no, we're gonna go camping. I'll, I'll do it up for you. I'll make it so you'll love it. And she's like, just laughing. Her parents are like, oh, good luck, Hunter. This is not, you know. Uh, and so I decide I buy luxuries. So I bought a tent. I bought an air mattress. Um, 
I think that's about it. I don't know what else I bought, but I, I felt like I was really overdoing it because normally I'm just used to like freezing at night out in the bush, like with nothing. And so we were in Bible college. I don't know if we were together at this time, but, but the family was going and I had finals, so we had to stay back late. I'd bought all this, this, like the tent and this air mattress and a thing to blow it up. And so we had finals. We were gonna get on the road and leave really late. And so I just pulled the air mattress out of the box and there were some like, there's like, st- like, I think they called them instructions, but I don't ever look at them. And there was a, something in the instructions that was actually pretty critical that I discovered at three in the morning when I was trying to set up the tent. My wife's kind of in the car. And what I realized is there's like the big plug to undo it. The cap was in the bag that I chucked. And so it's three in the morning for the air mattress. And I, I like go into the car. I'm like, I need matches. And I'm like, she's like, what is going on? And I'm like, ah, don't worry about it. I'm like trying to like not get in trouble. And I was like, I guess gonna set that thing on fire and squeeze it down to keep the air out. Let's just say it didn't work. And we're in there deflated. And my wife's like, Gunner, my family has a motor home. Can we go stay in the motor home? I'm like, no, we're married. You leave and cleave, <laughs> united. And she just like, it was the worst night of my life. She would tell you it was the worst night of her life. And so when I hear groaning and tent, I, I think of her. Uh, I don't know how this, the last six months have been for you. We were kind of watching the news and looking at Portland going, oh man, Portland, Seattle, those guys are all crazy up there. That'll never happen here. Turns out in La Mesa, the town I grew up in, and it happened. Uh, my hometown, two banks burned down to the ground, massive looting. The following weekend, on a Saturday, I had to run into town. I moved away, so I'm about an hour north. And, and as I drove into town, all, it, was, it was like going downtown Baghdad. All of the shops were boarded up with plywood. And it was horrible. People have been fleeing California. I don't know if people have been fleeing Oregon, but people have been fleeing California, and I've been like, this whole time, I'm like, I'm called here. I'm like, this is where I'm called. I'm content being here. And it was like the first time that I was like, I'm done with this. I want to leave. I want to get out of this place. But I realized that as I was having these thoughts of wanting to run away, the reality was it wasn't like, I wanted to go to Idaho where everybody in California seems to be going. It was like this whole world is a mess. And there was deep agony within me that I just, I wanted to be with him. Not that I was like suicidal or anything, but I I just, I was so tired of this place and, and seeing the sin and the stain of sin. And I think that this is what Paul is saying in these first few verses, this earthly tent, we groan, we, this isn't what we're created for. We're longing to be clothed with what he has for us. And then the very last part of verse four, he says, so that what is mortal will be swallowed up by life. And if you were to transport with me back to 2003, as I'm out at Pine Valley reading these verses, like I knew the answer about life after death but from my point of conversion to, to now or what, then, my worldview hadn't fully converted. So I knew that after death, the Bible promised eternal life, but at that moment, my worldview hadn't so much caught up with my theology, if that makes sense. And so when Tom died and what I was dealing with, to me at that point, what I had viewed death as, it was like one of those things that you snuff a, a, a candle out, that you, when you put out the candle, and if life was a little bit of candle, when you put it out, it's over. And so I was sort of gripped with this meaningless of life and what's the purpose and it just ends and grappling with all of these things. But when I... When I saw this swallowed up by life, it put death into a different perspective. And I know that when we face death, whether you are a believer or an unbeliever, death never sits right with our souls. And the reason is that we were not created to experience death. In Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse 11, we're told there by Solomon that God has placed eternity into our hearts 
And so whether it's a young life that's taken early or it's a 93-year-old, I just buried last week, last Saturday, a 93-year-old man who loved the Lord, who walked with the Lord since like the Korean War. And we all wept at his, at his funeral. We were happy. We all, we all knew he was with the Lord, but deep within us, it was like, it just doesn't sit right. And it's because we were not created to die. This is something when sin entered the world. And so for me to read this verse, suddenly death was described as something different. It doesn't say so that what is mortal will be snuffed out and it's the end and it's all that we are and you just go back into the, the universe and maybe the universe will keep like, you know, doing its stuff and you'll get whatever the world is telling you. But what it said, it was the mortal will be swallowed up by life that it was for the first time that this death was more of a transition, that we are actually like living death and we haven't really truly experienced life, but then we will actually experience life. We'll be swallowed up by life. I often think when I've seen, I've had the beauty of being at a church with a lot of elderly people and to see the grace that God gives people as they approach death, this longing and anticipation for it. It's hard to describe, but if you've ever seen a believer die, it's beautiful because they know. It's like they know. Now, verse five, now he who prepared us for this very purpose is God who gave us the spirit as a pledge. So now he's talking about believers. Now he who prepared us for this being swallowed up by life is God who gave us the spirit as a pledge. Now this should sort of sparks up and in your brain over in Ephesians chapter 1 verses 13 through 14 this is a passage that sort of explains Christianity in a nutshell it probably like it's you don't ever want to say like this is the most important verse in the Bible I find that whatever verse I'm teaching I was like this is the most important verse in the entire Bible And in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13, what we read there is, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, that Jesus, according to the scriptures, was crucified for your sins. He was buried, and then on the third day he rose from the grave. Those are the facts of the gospel. And we're told here that after listening to the message of the gospel of salvation, having also believed, it's activated. So you have the truth that's activated by your belief, and when you believe, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. So there's this promise. It's the seal that is given that the moment of your belief, the Holy Spirit seals you for the day of redemption. And he speaks of this, who gave us the Spirit as a pledge. Jesus paid it all. There's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. You simply activate it through faith, belief. Verse six, therefore, always be of good courage and knowing that while we are at home in this body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage. I say, and rather to be absent from the body and to be home with the Lord. He's saying, be of good courage. This is the great verse that's read at so many funerals. This is our reality while we're in this body. There's a separation between us and God that we have the spirit within us. We have fellowship with him, but it's, it's limited. It's not like the day when we transition from this life to the next life. And Paul says, be of good courage. It's not about looking at what you see in your day-to-day life. It's by verse seven, for we walk by faith. The things that we can't see. He goes on to say in verse nine, therefore we have also have as our ambition, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. So whether God gives you another day or another hundred years, as followers of Christ, our aim is to live, live each day faithfully to him in obedience to him, that at the end of our race we would hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. This doesn't mean perfection. Verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ 
so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. So here it is. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, every one of us, at our death, whether you believe or you don't believe. To the non-believer, you will stand before God and give an account of why you rejected Christ. To the believer... To the best of my imagination, which is not a very good imagination, to the believer, I think we're going to stand before God and we're going to have a PowerPoint presentation. I'm pretty sure that God has something more advanced than Microsoft PowerPoint, but it's just what kind of comes to my mind, is that I'm going to sit there and I'm going to see my gunner's life from beginning to end with the gifts, the talents, the resources that he has given to me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give an account. There's going to be the bad, which, praise the Lord, that was all covered on the cross, and then there's going to be the good. And, and somehow, like this is our imaginations, none of us, I mean, we can read the Left Behind books, you can listen to Pastor Pierre and his revelation, but at the, like there's a lot of it when we're just, it says that we're going to be receive some gifts. So I'm hoping to at least have one or maybe two things would be pretty cool, like that I did obediently that he's going to reward me for. And I know I'm short on time. I know I'm, uh, so the biggest question that I have for you is what have you done with Jesus? When I look at the pages of the New Testament, when I, when I look at the Gospels, you guys are going through Matthew. It's a great, it's a great Gospel. And one in particular That when I read the gospel, it's the religious people who seem to miss the very thing that God was doing in their midst. They thought they knew everything about God, yet they were the ones that were farthest from God. And so, no, I don't know any of I don't know any of you here. Like I know some of you, but I don't have a real relationship. You might be the most religious person. You might know all of the right answers. You might be going through all of the motions. You might tuck in your shirt and wear a tie and my people in my church are going to be, Gunner, you really got dressed up. So I hope this doesn't get me in trouble because I'm not as dressed up as this is my church and, and, and I'm distracted. But <laughs> what matters is what you've done with Jesus. And it would be of benefit for each of us to really examine What have you done with Jesus? You might be a Christian and you might be walking with the Lord for 50 years and you're really confident and I totally believe in the assurance of salvation but then there's like all of the problem verses in the Bible and I think that's God's grace to us that if we're not walking in total sort of reliance upon him and total dependence upon him, there's enough verses that will sort of shake our confidence which I think are for the point of drawing us back to him. And so my prayer is that each of you would be clear in your minds that it's not religion that saves you. It's not about good works. It's not about the translation of the Bible you read, what kind of music you listen to. It's about have you placed your faith in Jesus' wrists and the nails on his feet that the punishment the wrath that was placed upon him was for you and that you've received that by faith. Now for those of us who have trusted in Jesus, which I pray is the majority of us, we have hope. I'm just as guilty as the next guy for getting wrapped around the axle about the the political events, the news, the things we see on TV, the, 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 the drift of our nation and where we're heading. And it's very easy for me to to place my faith in in the wrong place. My wife, who is a way more spiritual person than I am, she's, you know, she's caught me getting all, you know, patriotic and kind of worried about the direction of of where we are as a nation. And she pulled me aside this week and she said, Gunnar, it's these pressures that create God to do things in our lives. If there was no Holocaust, there would be no Cory Ten Boom. I've seen another thing on the Facebook. If there was no Nebuchadnezzar, there would be no Daniel. And it's these moments of pressure that, that we're forced 
to really evaluate the things that matter most, and that's Jesus. And so I will say that I'm super grateful for the coronavirus. I'm super thankful for the things that I've seen in my church and what I've seen in the churches uh, worldwide about what really matters. We only have one life. Don't let your life go to waste. I've heard it said that you can't control the length of your life. You can only control the width of it. And so I would say make the most of it. And with that, I'll end with the the poem by C.T. Studd. I'm sure you have all heard it. And in there he writes, Only one life, it will soon be past. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I'm dying, how happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has burned out for thee. Father, we do thank you and praise you for the salvation that we have in Christ Jesus. We thank you that our relationship with you is based on grace alone. Father, we pray that you would help us to grow in our relationship with you. We ask that you would help us to grow in our passion for you, our sold outness for you. Father, we confess that for many of us, myself included, our worldview is tainted by the world. And there's so much in our thinking, in our truly, in our flesh, Lord, where we cling on to the things in this world. Father, we pray that you would help us to have a desire for your word, that we would consume it, that it would make itself into our minds and it would travel the 18 inches down to our hearts and that we would truly walk with you in faith. We thank you for your kindness towards us. We thank you for your uh, gentleness with us, your long suffering. Father, we ask that you would help us to go the distance in our lives for you. And we pray this in Christ's good name, amen.